Gracious Lord, as we walk along, we pray that you would teach us more of your ways, that you would help us to um, experience and receive and share more of your love. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, welcome. Glad you're here, Easter Sunday. Um, we gather this morning to celebrate the single biggest event in all of history as Christians view it, looking at um, celebrating the resurrection, that Jesus is alive, that he's risen, and to begin to unfold and think about what some of the implications of that are. I think the greatest of which is to think about how sin and evil and even death don't have the last word. And we gather every Sunday to celebrate that, but especially on Easter as we think about um, Jesus defeating death and being raised and, and what it means and where it goes from there. And what I'd like to do is we celebrate this morning with our um, scripture as we look at it. I want to go back to our gospel lesson today and look at these two guys walking on this road to Emmaus. And I want to look at it along with our own journeys and, um, and try to give us a reflection that will help us celebrate Easter even more. And we're doing this as part of a sermon series that we're starting today, where over the next number of weeks, we're going to be looking at what God did in the ancient church in the book of Acts, and starting today with Luke's, the same author, and then looking at what he does today and how he's doing things here and how we'll do things in our lives. That's what we're going to be looking at in the next coming weeks, and we hope you make plans to join us for that. But all of us in this room, even if you were dragged here today by somebody because it's Easter, all of us are on a spiritual journey. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where, how you describe that. We're all on some kind of journey. And I'm convinced that all of us deep down want this story to be true. Like we want there to be something. We, we don't want sin and evil and death to be the last word. We want there to be something else. And sometimes people will turn to us who wear collars and say, well, prove it to us. Prove it to us. And the truth is, we can't force you to believe anything. We cannot prove it in that kind of way, if that's what you mean. But we can come forward with great witnesses and great evidence and all this other stuff. But at the end of the day, you're always left with a choice, right? But we have great witnesses, and that's what matters, right? You know, two weeks ago, I was in a, a car wreck, and I had to call the insurance company. And one of the first things they asked me is, are there any witnesses? Because that's what matters to us, right? And when we look at all this stuff, there, there are kind of two categories of witnesses, I'm going to say, to the, to the Easter resurrection, the Easter miracle. The first of which are those back then. And you've got six different accounts in the Gospels. You've got Paul later on, he'll say, there, there, are more, there are 500 or more people who've seen the risen Lord. Let me connect you with one of those. That's what Paul's talking about. So you've got all, that, all the testimony of these ancient documents. And then you've got the countless number of people through the ages who will say, I've had an experience of the risen Lord. So you, you kind of get two different categories of witnesses. But it doesn't matter what I say or where we go or what the evidence is. At the end of the day, you're always going to be left with a choice on that. And what I'd like to do today is just kind of walk along this journey for a minute with a change taking place in two of the original followers these two guys that we read about in our gospel lesson today. So let me, let me start by just setting the stage for these two guys. So Friday, remember, Jesus has been, you know, betrayed, abandoned. He's been stripped, spat upon, beaten, bloodied, all of this stuff, mocked and killed and put in the grave. That's, that's what happens on Friday. And on Saturday, this whole day of Saturday, we don't have, you know, I can't read a bunch of texts about what happened, but I imagine all the followers of Jesus are completely dejected on Saturday. I don't know if you've ever been in the room with somebody or you yourself have been in a place where you faced an extreme tragedy, but there's oftentimes silence. And then finally somebody will break silence by saying, I can't believe they're gone. And you just sit there like that. And that's kind of the way it goes. And that's the way I think this day went because they expected something completely different. They expected a, a strong political Messiah, leader, who was going to kick booty on the Romans and put him out of Jerusalem. That's what they expected. And, that, and not only did that not happen, but now he's dead. And I just imagine that's where they're sitting. And then we come around to Sunday, and these women who go to the gravesite come back and say, like, the body's gone. 
we've encountered these angels who tell us that he's alive. And that's what they're all going on. That's the place that they're at. And these two guys, Cleopas is named. The other one is, not, is the unnamed disciple. They're probably one of, they're not one of the 12, but they're probably one of the 70 that Jesus sent out. And they're busy trying to, I mean, they're like, their world is in pain. And they're trying to figure all this out, but they're ready to get out of there. And they're like, let's move on. And so they head out to, towards Emmaus. And Emmaus was a little podunk village that was about seven miles from Jerusalem. It would have been about a two-hour walk from Jerusalem. And they, they head out. And these guys on this journey are really, really low. One of the biblical commentators I really like, William Barclay, the Scottish uh, commentator, he says that their faces are twisted with grief. That's how he describes them as they walk along and they have these discussions. And I think for all of us, everybody in this room will walk that road someday with their faces twisted with grief. We can have a sudden illness where we leave the doctor's office with our faces twisted with grief or one of our loved ones. I had uh, recently an aunt of mine who went from being diagnosed to passing on in seven weeks earlier this year. Did the funeral last weekend. And um, I just think about that. And all the people who are celebrating her life and all this and all her love and all this, but a lot of twisted faces with grief. Or those of us who've been pushed out of a job or unemployed or struggling with something at work. Or all the broken relationships in one form or another that we face and that we struggle with. All that stuff goes on. Sooner or later, we all walk this same road with a face twisted with grief. But notice what happens next, because these guys are walking along. They're having this discussion. How in the world did this happen? What do we make of this? And then we get to this point where Jesus comes along them. This is what verse 15 says. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near, and he went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And you get this moment where, I mean, they're, Jesus is walking along them. He's the stranger. They don't recognize him. And they're really sad. And Jesus is like, why are y'all so sad? And they're like, and if you read it again, they're like, well, we, we expected, we thought we had found the Messiah. This, we thought we'd found this political military strength that was going to rise up suddenly and was going to, like I say, push the Romans out and do all this. And, and not only did he not do that, but now he's dead. And they're like, and, and notice what Jesus does, because Jesus doesn't like immediately fix it. Like we pray for it. Like we all get down on our knees and pray, take this grief, take it from me, fix it now. And, you know, and you think about Jesus could have walked up and said, yeah, well, the cosmetic department had to redo me because of Friday when I got beat up. And y'all may not recognize me, but I'm Jesus. And let me tell you why this happened and whatever else. That's not what he does. But he does start to give them perspective. And he does start to give them hope. And you get in the passage we read that it says that he starts to explain to them the scriptures and why this had to happen, starting with Moses and going forward. And like, I don't want to overrate things, but this has to be the best Bible study ever, right? I only wish we had a silent auction where I could put on there two-hour Bible study with Jesus, right? <laughs> That's what these guys got. And he's opening up to them and explaining to them so that they can understand it wasn't the way you thought it was. Like, go back and look at these passages and understand that he's going to be beaten and all this for our transgressions. And all this stuff is, is in there. Go, and he opens all this stuff up. We don't know exactly that all the passages of what he said. But he's building hope in them and a perspective in them to see it. And I think this same kind of thing happens with us. We get in this road to Emmaus with our twisted faces of grief. And oftentimes, Jesus comes along us as a stranger, one of these God moments of somebody who gives us a word of encouragement when we need it, who somehow helps us to see there's life after whatever's happening, who somehow helps us to see that God may be working through it and builds hope and perspective in us. I think the same thing happens. God uses the stranger that way. And I think the next thing that happens is important in this um, passage, the way it unfolds, because they're walking along and they finally get to the end of the road and they're, 
they're at Emmaus, and Jesus is kind of like, okay, yeah, nice talking to you guys. I'm, I'm heading on. And they're like, okay, hold on. Wait a minute. It's late in the day. You do not want to be on a first century Palestinian road walking alone at night. It's late in the day. You're hungry. Why don't you come stay with us? That's the invitation that they make. And I, I wonder, we don't know why Jesus sort of pretended that he was going on, but I, I sort of wonder if it wasn't a test of some kind because, you know, Jesus in his ministry was so big on service. I mean, the night before he dies, he's not only telling them, I came to serve you, but he's like, okay, for those of you who are a little bit slow, let me, let me get down on my knees and wash your feet and do this lowly servant thing so you can get, I came to serve, and if you're going to love me and follow me, you're going to serve. And so he washes their feet and does this. And during his ministry, he says, look, the two greatest laws, love God with everything, love your neighbor as yourself. And the only time Jesus ever talks about judgment, he doesn't talk about a whole bunch of spiritual formulas. He talks about what you've done to the least of these. Did you clothe the naked? Did you see me in prison? And you may remember the line where he says, did you welcome the stranger? And that's what these guys, these two guys, Cleopas and this unnamed guy, they do on this day. They welcome the stranger and say, come dine with us. And I, I wonder at this moment, just for a minute, what would it have been if they had not invited him? I wonder, because later on they're going to say their hearts burned when he was doing this Bible study. I wonder if the next day they would have been, got up and said, you know, our hearts were burning. Do you think there's any chance that was Jesus? And we just let him go off in the dark on that road? Happily, that's not what they did. So they invite him in, and they invite him in for, for dinner. And I don't know how all this goes, but they, the, he's the stranger, the guest, and they ask him if he's, gonna, if he's gonna do the blessing or whatever, or maybe he volunteers. I don't know how it goes. But what we know is the next thing that happens is that Jesus um, does this. This is verse 30 and 31. When he was at table with them, he took bread, he blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. What does that sound like? He took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. Like maybe something that happens back here. It's a moment really of worship. There are three of them in that room. Jesus does this, and they, it's that moment that their eyes are opened. And they see him for who he is. And I want to suggest to you that that's the way it happens often for us as well. We oftentimes encounter God here in worship. I mean, Jesus tells us when two or three are gathered together in his name, there I am in their midst. And it's not about, um, you know, it's not about anything else. We come here because we get some of that, right? Now, there are reasons not to come. Some people will say the church is messed up. They hurt me on this day. They did this wrong. That's always going to happen because for whatever reason, Jesus has populated the church with broken people who get stuff wrong. But at the end of the day, two or three are gathered in his name. There he is. And week after week, we come and worship and we get little glimpses here and there along the way of who he is. And our eyes are opened in different ways and encouraged in that. It's not about the preacher. I had nothing to do with the poster, I will promise you. It's not, it's not about... <laughs> It's not about the music, as great as it is. It's not about all that. It's about the community coming together in worship and experiencing God in that place. And notice what happened next, right? Because these guys are there. They encounter him. Their eyes are open. They see who he is, and then he vanishes. And then their next thing is like, holy smokes, that was Jesus. They go like, we got to get back and tell everybody. So they get on the road, and this journey that may, maybe took them two hours to walk, they run probably in an hour or less, they go banging on the upper room saying, let us in, we got to tell you what's happened. And they share all the, whatever's happened and the disciples there share what's, what they've learned and what they've happened and everybody's having this big moment. And then all of a sudden, we, we cut our passage off today right before it. But the very next verse, Jesus appears in that room. And he says to them, peace be with you. And notice what he doesn't say, right? He doesn't show up and say, Welcome, disciples and followers, prosperity be with you. Or he doesn't show up and say, welcome, faithful followers, right relationships and perfect relationships be with you. He shows up and he says, peace. And I think when our eyes are opened and when we go to that place with him and we commune with him, it's ultimately about coming to a place of harmony and peace with him.
and perspective in seeing all that. That's the blessing that comes with it. And it's a journey. We're all in different places on it. But I think the way we get more of that peace and the way we see more of that is by making a choice to follow him and by trusting him. And I think if we want to turbocharge our Easter celebration, that's how we do it. We come back to this place where we're willing to say, I choose you, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to trust you. And it helps this celebration we have today swell up in our hearts, I think, in a fresh way, um, where it's very authentic and real that we're celebrating that Jesus is risen. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, um, we thank you so much uh, for your presence in our lives. Give us eyes to see your hand at work. We ask you to help us to trust in your love. Help us to trust you and walk with you. Help us to trust that you will forgive whatever we've done, wherever we've been. Help us to follow. And Lord, we ask as these two guys set the example for us today, help us to always be about welcoming the stranger. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.